So again, hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so this will be a very different talk. It'll be an interdisciplinary talk. Um, uh, as you just said, I'm I'm physicist by training. I'm in physics and applied math department at University of Washington and also at the Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center. So you can see already interdisciplinarity in all my affiliations. And so since my PhD, I've been doing, you know, poking at, at all of these fields at the same time. And so hopefully I can, today I can give you a flavor of what we do. Um, so I decided to talk about something that, um, is there a way we can? I think that's on this end because it's not on my end. Uh, it's not I, here. I, I, that is on this end. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I decided to talk about something quite new in my group. Uh, it still connects to all the old work that we've been thinking about, but um, you'll see that there is there is sort of new flavor, and it's in connection somewhat to the Nobel Sym Symposium we had on AI, and I thought it's fitting to kind of share those ideas with you. So as you just said, I'm interested in adaptive immu immune system. So this is a new area, well, not anymore new. In the past five, six years, I've been working quite a bit in this area. And it's a, uh, I guess by now everyone is expert in adaptive immunity after you know many years of dealing with COVID and immune response. So adaptive immune system is a fascinating process in our body that basically uses all possible biophysical features to protect us against pathogens. What we have is diverse repertoire of cells. So the main actors in adaptive immune system are B cells and T cells. And more or less every B cell and every T cell has its own unique receptor on its cell surface. And so the diversity of receptors that we have counter the diversity of pathogens that we encounter. And as a result of that, we can um, cover the space of pathogens that you will see, and we can even mount responses against pathogens that even didn't exist when we were born. So say COVID, right? And this is adaptively generated throughout our lifetime. It gets developed as we grow and as we um, encounter new pathogens. So we mount specific responses and we also keep a memory of previous infections to be better uh, sort of more readily responding in the next encounter. So we have B cells, T cells, pathogenic epitopes on the other side and interactions between both of them. So um, maybe about 20, 30 years ago, there was this abstraction of immune, immune response or what's called immune shape space. It was introduced without actually being well characterized at the molecular level. So what's the idea? The idea is, you know, on, there's a dual space. On the top is this thing called immune shape space. And in the bottom, we have antigenic or pathogenic shape space. So receptors on the top, when they're close to each other, it means that two receptors that are close, they can react with similar pathogens. And if you have two pathogens that are close to each other in the bottom sort of layer, then they can be recognized by similar antibodies, B cell receptors, T cell receptors. So this is an idea out there that people have been thinking about. No one knows, knows how many dimensions this system has. Basically, we don't really know the structure of this shape space. There's also on top of that, there's this idea of there should be some holes in the space because we don't want to have self-reactive receptors, otherwise we will be autoimmune. But this is also being debated at the moment. There's a lot of self-reactive receptors in all of them and in all of us and we are just dynamically suppressing their response. So it's not quite right that self-reactivity is taken care of at the receptor level. Anyways, my goal in the past so many years have been to map out this immune shape space in some ways. And we have tried our luck with many different tools and data sets out there. So one very common data set that people, have been, including us, have been looking at it's been DNA sequences of these receptors because you can extract a lot of DNA now from the blood and read out you know, variation of these receptors. You can build co-evolutionary modeling. So Yinja mentioned non-equilibrium statistical physics and that 
blends in there quite well, but we weren't, you know, successful in sort of in a satisfactory way to map out the shape space. We learned a lot of things, but not what we actually intended. So here comes the new thing. Um, these receptors are proteins, right? And pathogens, on the other hand, majority of pathogens we deal with are also proteins. So don't uh, get scared if you don't, if you're not familiar with these shapes. Usually when you want to show proteins, you show this, you know, ribbons and things. So these represent three-dimensional shape of proteins. So in the bottom uh, left here, we have antibody protein or antibodies are basically detached B cell receptors. So these are B cell receptors interacting with a pathogenic protein. The next one is T cell receptor interacting with its own antigen and some presenting molecule. And uh, there are other kinds of molecules we deal with, like lipids and stuff, but majority of stuff we, we, we see our immune system sees are proteins. So if you want to understand immune shape space, we actually need to understand protein shape space. So that's how the, this line of work started, to get into understanding a general sort of understanding of a protein universe and use that to go down to understand immune receptors in particular. Okay. Well, when I started thinking about that, I'm not I'm no biochemist, I'm a theoretical physicist. So there, it was completely wishful thinking to start in doing biochemistry. So that was out. But I knew how to code, so I thought, why not? I can try to you to uh, to uh, you know use computers and machine learning because that's right now at the forefront of protein science to understand something about protein universe. So that's what you'll hear today. Okay. Before that, majority of you, I suppose, are physicists. So let me introduce what actual proteins are. Um, before I started this project, proteins to me were a bunch of letters, 20 amino acids, and I could write it down and theoretically treat them. And that was satisfactory enough for what I wanted. But in reality, the molecules and they contain atoms. So carbon, carbon hydrogen, nitrogen, various things. And generally each amino acid, as you can see here, they have a backbone and the backbones are the same for all amino acids, but then you also have side chains and side chains basically are the features that differ from one protein to another. And you know we are not gonna go into detail of how they look different, but they're, they really chemically look different from each other and they have different properties. So the information initially is encoded well, in DNA, then to amino acid sequence, and then you basically fold the amino acid sequence in a three dimension, so territory structure, which then determines protein function. So you have this hierarchy of events, you go from sequence to structure to function. And function may be interaction of two proteins or something like that. So as I mentioned, there has been a lot of work in recent years, especially in machine learning uh, using you know, AI basically in protein science. And I think one famous one is uh, the protein folding channel uh, challenge. There's been a challenge for the past 50 years. So going from a sequence to a protein structure. So our body does that. If you start from a sequence, you put it in a living organism, it falls into a protein structure. Why can't we be able to do that on a computer? So in the past 50 years, it hasn't been really a successful endeavor. A lot of smart people have been working on that. But then um, AlphaFold came along and it made a huge leap in, in folding a protein. So this is run by DeepMind uh, in, in London, which is basically a Google uh, uh, sort of science, uh, science camp or this. And they have done a lot of other things in uh, solving Go and various things, but also protein folding was one of, the, one of their projects. And uh, yeah, so they can now fold proteins with 90% accuracy or more. And it's, it's pretty amazing what they have managed to do. But aside from this sequence to structure map, if you wish, there has been also a lot of work uh, trying to go from sequences to actual function of a protein. So these work, I think there are many different flavors of them, but a lot of them are inspired by what we call language models. So language models are things we use every day when we Google something, right? Um, 
And the idea is there is to, well, in computer science, the idea was there to, to, to understand or to model the distribution of words in natural languages. And, um, you know, just briefly, if I want to kind of characterize what these language models do, you give some, you train your neural network with a bunch of text. You try to understand a low dimensional representation of your text. So a picture down here is trying to reflect what, what a network could learn. It's a wrong picture, but it gives you a good idea. So let's say I'm, I have a vector associated with man and vector associated with royal, and I add these two up and it should give, give me a king. And if I have a woman plus royal, it should give me a queen. Right, so that's kind of an idea of representation or low dimensional representation. Now, protein scientists thought, okay, this is a great idea, it's super successful. Why not we feed in uh, protein sequences instead of Shakespeare, right? And what do we get out of that? So a lot. Uh, so if you do that, you can try to predict, um, you know, uh, evolutionary processes in proteins. You can try to predict viral escape. And there has been examples of successful efforts in both of these stories. So this is all good. We can probably go home if we can do everything. But the reality is uh, we're still far away. We still don't know why each of these models quite work and what exactly they're capturing. And so in a sense, as scientists, we want to understand what's going on. And also, they don't solve everything. So in a practical sense, we are also not yet there. So I mentioned to you, we have a sequence to structure to a function map, uh, right? So that's just the biology. We have AlphaFold that does sequence to structure. We have these natural language processing models that go from sequence to function. But if you go from sequence to function, it means that the model you're inferring also has knows something about sequence to structure. So it's a bit of a convoluted model, right? It captures the stuff from the first step and the second step, and that's not so great. Now, nowadays that we have so many protein structures either available experimentally or computationally, the idea for us was, can we just start from protein structure and try to predict function without you know, thinking about sequence at all, right? Someone gave me the structure uh, as a as a physicist, I would never know what this structure does, but also most biochemists can't tell you what the protein would do given a protein structure. So that's that's the question. So to be more concrete, let's say I have I give you the same antibody and antigen protein co-crystallized structure. So something like this, both together. And so by that, it means I give you coordinates of all the atoms and identity of all the atoms in both sides. Can you tell me what's the binding affinity between these two proteins? Can you improve the binding affinity by changing one side a little bit? So these are concrete question. You can call it engineering question. If you want to understand better how things work, maybe it's a physics question. But yeah, so you can ask these type of question and try to answer them. So that's what I mean by structure to function. All right. So people have been thinking about the structure to function map. Um, I think the most intuitive way of thinking about machine learning approaches, like when you're doing machine learning, you start off with existing methods. Generally, when you do physics, you start off with the existing method. And a lot of machine learning has been developed in the context of pattern recognition and image processing, right? And so the first effort for a structure to function map has been, let's treat these protein structures as three-dimensional images and try to parse that in the same way. So when you look at the image, you have pixels of the image and you sort of put zeros and one in your image, right? So numbers associated with like maybe colors within a pixel. So for protein structures, now you have a 3D cubes, right? Instead of pixelizing, you voxelize, which is three-dimensional pixels. So you have different atoms, so they come in different cubes, each one for, for its own atom. And so that would be a representation of a protein structure. And so say I have a bunch of proteins with different binding pockets here, different colors, right? And so they come with measurements of binding energy of that binding pocket to some some other protein, and I want to build a machine learning algorithm that relates the left-hand side to the right-hand side, right? You can do that. So people have done versions of this. And so to do this, you have to do some, you have to sort of take some steps. You first want to maybe orient all your proteins in the same directions because otherwise things become arbitrary. 
machines are not, you know, as smart as we are looking at different orientations and feeling things shouldn't depend on the global orientation. You need to bin the data. And so also if I input one orientation and learn only for one orientation, that's not enough because then someone else come and give a slightly rotated version of protein, you get competing nonsense out of the learned model. So you train a model with many different rotated version of the input and that's called data augmentation. Because in that case, you're sort of guaranteed you, you get the same answer if you train it this way. But it's also computationally very costly because rotation in 3D, you can do many different orientations, right? Um, and I think a more fundamental problem with this is that it is not guaranteed that the model you're learning is independent of the orientation. So in principle, your network could learn one model for every single orientation. And that's the extreme, but you can go somewhere in between. So that's not desirable as a physicist, right? My energy model should not depend on global orientation. So in a sense, I need to have a neural network that would respect this global rotational symmetry in the data. And that's what we were after. So satisfying rotational symmetry while learning whatever task I'm trying to learn. Okay. So here's, here's the problem. I want to respect rotational symmetry on the way I want to also avoid this voxelization, the spinning of the data, because it's computationally very uh, inefficient way of treating these data sets. The data is very sparse. And that's what, what I'll tell you in, in this talk. So how do we go about do this? OK, so symmetry has a long history in physics, as physicists, we kind of respect symmetry in our daily lives, right? So this is a picture of Emmy Noether. Uh, as Yinja mentioned, I spent some time in Göttingen, and Emmy Noether is a very known mathematician in Göttingen and also in the world. So in her paper in 1918, uh, she basically drew an analogy between symmetry and conservation laws. Right. So when we have time translation of symmetry, you have energy conservation, translation symmetry, momentum conservation and rotational symmetry, then uh, conservation of angular momentum. Now, around the same time, we have Albert Einstein, uh, who spent some of his time in Göttingen, but this was not during that time. Um, who introduced the principle of covariance. So what is the principle of covariance? It says the laws of nature should not depend on your reference frame, right? If I make a measurement in one reference frame, I should have a theory that would describe it in another reference frame. And so the popular examples here are equivariance between electricity of magnetism. If I measure, uh, if I'm static with respect to a charge, and I only measure electric field. If the charge is moving, I measure both electric and magnetic field. And so if you go to a Minkowski representation, you have a theory that basically states that these two are equivar uh, equivariant. So you have a full theory. Same goes for acceleration and gravity, right? So I want a machine learning algorithm that does this thing properly, that has the equivariance between the two. Okay, so... You know, in machine learning and computer science, these ideas existed before, but mainly in the domain of, again, image processing and in two dimensions. And in that case, you mainly think about uh, translation in 2D. So if you don't know anything about machine learning, you know that in machine learning, people want to classify cats and dogs, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the main objective. So, um, yeah, so you train a network on images of cats and dogs, and then usually you do it on natural images. So cats can be at, across different places in the image, dogs the same way. And so you don't want your network to be super sensitive of where the head or the nose of the dog or a cat is, right? And uh, yeah, this is my dog, <laughs> Lito. And so what, uh, what we had here was... You know, in convolutional neural networks that are pretty efficient in doing the classification, you have this um, convolutional filters. So the filters are small, uh, sort of a bunch of pixels, basically. That's the size of a filter, and you can go with a small with this small filter throughout the image and pick up features of the image. So if you're now hitting a nose filter, irrespective of where the nose is. Uh, a nose filter and a nose of a dog give you a larger signal. And so the eye filter and the eye of a dog, irrespective of where the eye is, 
gives you a signal of existence of I at that spot. So then you can convolve these filters, right, the outputs, and then you can pull the data. So you do some linear and nonlinear operations, and voila, you can classify cat and dog. Um, so yeah, so in a sense, uh, machine learning or computer science have thought about translation of symmetry. What we wanted to do is thinking about the rotation symmetry and in three dimensions. So I've used the term equivariance kind of loosely in this talk, and I want to introduce what exactly it means mathematically. Um, so let's start from simpler thing, invariance. So imagine we have a water molecule here, right? And the atomic mass of a water molecule is an invariant of orientation of water molecule. I think that's intuitive. So if I rotate my water molecule, I have a function f. I, I claim this function is invariant of, of the rotation. So the rotation, I express it with this operator dr1 for the water molecule. And the atomic mass is now um, you know, transformed by identity operator. So it's invariant. So equivariance is, uh, is a more general form of invariance. Um, so instead of atomic mass, let's assume you're looking at dipole moments, right? When you rotate your, uh, your molecule, your dipole moment should also rotate. So, you know, you have two different operators in this case, because the first one operates in the space of water molecules and the second one, the space of dipole moments. And so you have a well-defined operator that tells you if I rotate the object, how the output of the function rotates, right? And it is a linear operator in this case. And that's why we're kind of interested in this because we can use it for many different purposes. Okay, so this is rotational equivariance maybe in one sentence. <laughs> And what I will do uh, for the protein problem is I will have a protein structure. I will learn first, or try to tell you how I will do that, uh, how to learn a, um, rotationally equivariant encoding of the structure. So how do I encode the structure? And then how do I process the encoded structure to learn a model? So the second step would be a neural network. The first step would be whatever encoding I'm doing. And then how do I use this learned model to predict anything functional? And so I think some of you are physicists. You may know that if you're thinking about rotation and equivariance, rotational equivariance or rotational symmetry, you might, it might be useful to think about spherical harmonics. You know? So and we'll, we'll make an analogy there to your knowledge of quantum mechanics back in the days. OK, so you'll see a lot of spherical harmonics in, in the next few slides. All right. So, yeah, symmetry. Uh, generally, Fourier representation is a useful thing when we have symmetry in a problem. So, a normal sort of wave dynamics that we teach in classrooms, right? Uh, trans we have translation of symmetry. And so, we do a normal Fourier transform, right, with the e to the ikx. And so, it takes you from a time domain to a frequency domain. If you have a normal wave, you get a single number out, and it's a perfect representation of that wave. Now, if you have rotational symmetry, the Fourier transform would involve spherical harmonic as your basis, right? And so this is also in 3D spherical space uh, coordinate system, right? And you get you know, two coefficients, the degree and rank of your associated with degree and rank of your spherical harmonics. And you have these structures because you know L is integer and M goes from minus L to L. So you get triangles out of it. So um, so this is what we learn in quantum mechanics when we want to represent angular momentum, especially, right? Writing hydrogen atom and things like that. Uh, but then mathematically, this spherical harmonics, these YLMs are also quite useful because they are irreducible representation of SO3. So SO3 is a group that is rotations around the fixed origin, right? A frick, a fixed reference point, so all rotations. And so if you have an irreducible representation, that means you can have this, um, this operator for the equivariance operator that is linear and it can give you how you exactly transform when you transform your object. And from, from quantum mechanics, we know the operator. It's a Wigner D matrix, right? So we know exactly how to write this. So here, is, here it is. If I make a linear transformation, so if I rotate my object, um, I have a spherical harmonic and it transforms with a Wigner D matrix. 
And to be pedantic, Wigner D matrix is actually the representation of SO3, not spherical harmonics, because representations are matrices. But uh, but generally, it is it is that. So that that serves us with linear operation of our neural networks. That's how we operate in linearly. But then we have nonlinearity. So neural networks um, are known to be expressive because they have a lot of nonlinear operations. So if you have done any machine learning, you are maybe familiar with terms like ReLU or sine function or things like that, right? So different nonlinear shapes that you apply. So if you apply any of those things in the spherical Fourier space on this kind of signal, you lose rotational equivariance. But again, from quantum mechanics, we know there are ways of combining your angular momenta. And so the way we do that in quantum mechanics is klebsch gordon tensor products, right? So spin-spin interactions. And so you can do exactly that um, for nonlinearity in your neural network. And so these two components basically give you how to linearly transform and nonlinearly transform your objects. And so we didn't come up with all of these things. Um, the, since 2016, there has been a small niche, now a very growing niche of computer scientists, some of them physicists, who um, were interested in, in understanding symmetry in neural networks. They call it group equivariant machine learning or geometric deep learning. And so we had Max Welling actually last, last week um, in uh, Stellenbosch, uh, who gave a fantastic talk, but there were also others, Risi Condor, Taco Cohen, Tess Schmidt, and many others who've been working in this area and developing really strong mathematical foundation. So that inspired us quite a bit. Um, so to use these ideas to do something about protein. So that's where some of these ideas come from. Okay. So we have all the, all the ingredients. Um, so here's the problem we want to solve as a first First problem, right? Um, I want to learn statistics of protein microenvironments. I'll be specific what it is in a minute, but I want to basically solve Lego pieces, Lego pieces of a protein structure. So here's a protein structure, and you'll see now uh, amino acid in this protein structure is now highlighted in orange. So now I take all the atoms of this uh, amino acid of the structure. So I mask the amino acid and I look at the surrounding of that amino acid in the protein structure and keep the atoms, let's say in 10 angstrom around that center amino acid. So I'm now gonna ask the question, can I predict the identity of that amino acid that I have masked given everything around it? So why is this an important question uh, or a useful question to ask? is because effectively we're trying to learn an effective potential in this protein environment to determine what should sit there, right? And so if we learn that, then we can do a lot of other things with it. So let's see if we can do it. So here's the input, my protein neighborhood or microenvironment with amino acid at the center mask. I, uh, for sort of simplicity, let's look at only the carbon atoms in that environment. So you can think about it as a point cloud in 3D, bunch of carbons, presence or absence, and you can define this density of carbons as, I, you can write the density function, which is a sum of bunch of delta functions, whether you're present or not. So the first step is to encode this structure, and we want to encode it using our spherical harmonics. But the spherical harmonics only take care of the angular parts, right? Um, we need to also take care of the radial component of these atoms, right? How far you're from the center. And so for that, you need a radial expansion. Um, there are many different ways of doing this. So we use Zernike uh, polynomials to do that. And Zernikes are known in, uh, in optics. Um, Zernike got a Nobel Prize. Um, I don't remember on what, but he got a Nobel Prize uh, in physics. Um, yeah, so effectively you get three coefficients, LM that come from YLM, from spherical harmonic, and N that takes care of your radial component. So three different integers, and there are some constraints of what these numbers can be. So instead of having one triangle from one spherical harmonic, now you have N of these triangles for all the radial components. And so then you do it for all your uh, atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, hydrogen, and also some of the properties of these atoms, like how close they are to the surface called SASA or charge. 
So you can you can do whatever game you want to do with this to encode the information, right? So the interesting thing about this Zernike uh, transformation is that the thing you get out of it is actually a transposition of some uh, of spherical holograms. So if you were to build a real hologram out of these atoms and then you know transpose them on top of each other, you get something like like this Zernike transform. So for branding, we call our encoding, a holographic encoding of our protein microenvironment. Um, so I think that's that's a fun name to call these things. Yeah, so these holograms are inputs to our neural network, right? So we start off with the amino acid, the, the point clouds, the Fourier holograms, and then I, I pass these holograms that were the input to a neural network that is now rotationally equivariant. So that means you have your uh, your Wigner D matrices and your Krebs Gordon products to operate on these holograms, and you collect a bunch of invariants, so L equals zeros of different layers. You pass it through some dense layers. So it's a bit technical. I'm happy to talk about it later. Whoever is interested. And so the output, uh, so I'm training this network, the weights of this network. And so the output I get, um, first I get some sort of scores or what I call pseudo energies for different types of amino acids. So it gives me gives me how, uh, how each amino acid, what's the score or a preference for having a different type of amino acid out of the 20 in that neighborhood. And then I run it through a Fermi function, a sigmoid function, softmax, wherever you come from, you call this function slightly differently to get probabilities out, right? And so that, that's a normalized vector that gives you relative probability of different amino acids for that neighborhood. So I'm gonna use this term pseudo energy because I'll take this a bit seriously as energy and use it in the next slide and see how whether or not it's a real energy. Uh, but yeah, so this is basically the whole formalism. You train a network, you optimize your weights to based on input from all protein structures that you have in protein data bank and try to see what you get out of it. So let's see what we get out of it. So the first task is, you know, if I train the network and then test it on a different set of protein structures, can I predict the, you know, the amino acid that sit in there accurately? And the answer is, yeah, it's pretty accurate. It's 70% accurate. So the, the matrix you're seeing here uh, on the vertical side is the input amino acids and the horizontal side are the predicted amino acids. The best case scenario, 100% would be all diagonal, right? But we have some freedom, so it's like, 30% lack of accuracy. But uh, what, what we see is actually, um, you know, the confusion that we see in the network is quite consistent with the physiochemical properties and the size of these amino acids. So if you look at the clusters that we have here, so say hydrophobic cluster, oops. Okay, hydrophobic cluster here, we have a, medium-sized hydrophobics and small-sized hydrophobics clustered together. And so the other properties as well. So the way we are confusing things actually makes sense. Um, the 70% accuracy is equivalent to state-of-the-art accuracy when people do this voxelization, uh, you know, the, the image processing thing, but it is orders of magnitude faster. So to give you a sense, other people, so with the image processing, they use, you know, six GPUs, two weeks of training to get the same result we do with one GPU in a few hours, right? So why is that? The reason is that we are not looking over a whole model space, rather we'll, we're constraining our models to be rotationally equivariant to respect symmetry. As a result, we get a lot of computational benefit out of this. Um, so yeah, so this is a task we set about to solve. We solved it. What do we get out of it? What are the features of the model that we have learned? So the first thing I went on about was we have symmetry. Symmetry relates to physics, right? Do we get anything physical out of the model that we have learned, right? So the, uh, the easy way of testing if, if our energies are physical is that, okay, is our networks living in some energy potential that, that is consistent with our intu intuition? And what is our intuition? The proteins that we see have been evolving for so many millions of years. And um, they're probably somewhat optimal, the neighborhoods that you're seeing. 
Um, so if I perturb the neighborhood around the amino acid, I should increase the energy. So basically, is the true neighborhood in an energy minimum of the network? And so that's the question we can ask. So we can distort the neighborhood and you can do it in many different ways. We did it by sheer perturbation of a protein. You move to backbone angles. So what exactly it does is that you're doing the shearing here in, at, this, at this residue down here. So the protein kind of gets distorted a little bit. And so we ask if I do the shearing, do you see the energy that I calculate to, uh, you know, for the native structure to be at the minimum of the energy landscape? Okay, so how do we test this? We have a protein up here. It's being sheared. You can calculate the energy using the already trained network. You can look at the change in the energy due to shear, native structure versus you know, the shear structure. And you can look at the distortion in the protein structure due to your shear. And what we see here is that this is now for a protein called protein G. It's a relatively small protein. At 56 sites of the protein, you can shear it at different sites. Generally, your energy landscape is quadratic with a zero with a minimum set at zero distortion, indicating that we have probably learned something that is akin to energy potential uh, or physical potential. So this was not our intention. We haven't trained the network to learn physics, but it seems to have learned physics. And that's kind of exciting, and we can probably use it to do other things with it. Our goal was to learn function. So have we learned anything functional about these amino acids? So we've tested func function question uh, in many different ways. So I'll show you a few examples just to highlight. Um, so the first example is basically a model system of protein structures called a T4 lysozyme protein. Um, and the reason it's um, interesting, well, for us, it's a, it's a useful model system is that there are many mutants of these protein available out there. And by mutant, you just change one amino acid to another, right? And uh, along with the mutant sequence, you also have structure of that new mutant. So I can see how much the structure has changed after that mutation. So this is a wild type T4 lysozyme. I'm highlighting here two amino acids, one in orange, one in purple. And so on the right-hand side, we have a mutation from orange to yellow, which is a neutral mutation. It does not impact the stability of protein. And uh, uh, the other mutation from purple to pink is a destabilizing mutation. So it distorts the protein structure or stability. And so we have 40 of these protein structures available for T4 lysosome. It's unique. Um, and so this is more or less the summary statistics if you look at our predictions for these different Variant. So it's a convoluted picture. So let me just walk you through it. So on the vertical axis, you have these different mutants. So for example, the way to read this is that I3Y, it means that there's an amino acid mutation from I in the Y type structure at position three to Y in the mutant structure, right? And so on the left hand side, I have um, predictions from the network, assuming that everything is on the Y type of structure. So what's the probability of seeing a different 20 amino acids that we have? This alpha is possible 20 amino acids. These are on the X axis. Log probability of that minus log probability of Y type on the Y type of structure. Just to, you know, there's a gauge invariance here. You want to zero something. And then on the right-hand side, you do the same ex exercise, but using the corresponding mutant structure. And so a uh, quantity that measures stability of proteins, if you remember your chemistry, is delta delta G, right? And uh, if you were to calculate that, you want to calculate the probability of seeing a mutant se mutation, a specific mutation on the mutant sequence or a structure, minus probability of seeing wild type on the wild type structure. And so, and so that's what's plotted here. And so the, the more red you have, the more destabilizing the effect, and the more blue is the more stabilizing or beneficial the effect. And what we see is that destabilizing category that you know experimentalists told us tend to be all pretty red, and neutral or mildly beneficial ones are tend to, they tend to be blue. And so if you look at actually delta delta G versus prediction, we have a very good agreement between measurements. So 
Uh, predicting a stability effect of mutations has been a very difficult task. AlphaFold is not successful in doing that because it's not trained to do that, for example. Older methods use some uh, physical models to do that um, and are not necessarily that successful. So we're quite excited about this because, again, our model was not trained to do this task. It's just a consequence of what we have learned so we can do this. Um, the other thing we managed to do is looking at protein and um, ligand or small molecule um, structures. So we can look at data sets that have a protein and together with a light, small molecule and with their corresponding binding energy. So dissociation constant, KD. And so what we can do is we can ask whether our network can predict the binding affinity in this structure. So in this case, I go around this ligand or binding pocket and I take 10 angstrom neighborhoods around it. And I look at the protein with the ligand and without the ligand and calculate the difference in the energy that my network is reporting. So if this energy was truly the binding energy, I would expect this to be proportional to logarithm of KD or minus logarithm of KD in this way, right? So it's a minus log K, so a change in energy, and there's a factor L, which is your chemical potential. So the longer it is, you have a long uh, sort of entropic effect, so to speak. And so you can just plot this thing against each other and see what you get. You get about 50% correlation without doing any fine tuning with this analysis. So that's kind of impressive on its own. You can do a little bit of fine tuning to learn Scale energy scales for different amino acids separately, so learn another 40 numbers, so to speak. And so you can boost up your prediction to about 65%. So this is, again, in a sense, what in computer science they call zero-shot prediction. We are not really fitting an extra model for any of this consequence of original model. Okay, so the last example that I show you is something going back to immune receptors, so in this case, T cell receptor. And, um, and so this is very much a preliminary analysis. So we were quite encouraged by the structure of our network and we wanted to see, can we say something about immune receptors with that? So T cell receptor interaction with peptide and this molecule called HLA, which is expressed on all our cells basically, is um, surprisingly a difficult problem if we were to cal calculate the binding affinity between the two. The peptides tend to be small. They're like 10, 11 amino acid long, something like that. But we and others have tried to predict, you know, what peptide binds to what T cell receptor or TCR. And as from the sequence, and it's been very, very difficult. And why is it an interesting problem? Because uh, currently uh, you might have heard about cancer immunotherapy and cancer vaccines using antigens that would then bind, using your immune system basically to target cancer cells. And so there, it's a really a problem of design. So how well a cancer immunotherapy would work given the peptides that you're presenting in your body, given the epitopes of the cancer. And so knowing whether the immunotherapy would work or not would, you know, would be quite cost efficient in terms of therapy. And you don't want to put people on the therapy knowing that it's not going to work on them. So that's that's one thing. And then on the, on the other side, you want to be able to design peptides that actually trigger immune response. So that's why a lot of people are interested in this. And so we thought, okay, maybe we can use our model to see whether we can predict binding of peptides to TCR. So here's sort of a cartoon of the problem. We, uh, we take a TCR structure, HLA structure, or this HLA molecule, and then the peptide. We it will be done in two minutes. So HLA molecule and the peptide. And so I, I strip out uh, sort of all the atoms of the peptide. So I have basically a line that tell me where it goes more or less. And then I use my model to sample peptides from all this based on their energies, right? Based on their pseudo energy. So I sample from our model from holographic convolutional neural network. Then I relax these structures together using existing tools. I iterate until convergence. So this is one way of representing what we did versus what the experiments do. It's a bit, um, I don't like it personally the way they do it, but uh, that's how, how you represent peptide distribution in biology. So on the top, this is an experiment done on this particular set of molecules on 
and the results is from 26 different bound peptides. So these are all good peptides. And at each position, you have, in principle, you can have 20 different amino acids. And the sort of length of these letters is proportional to the probability of these amino acids. And the colors show somewhat the properties. So out of the 26, this is sort of the structure you get. Uh, our prediction is below, so we're not limited to 26, so we get a lot more variability. We get uh, the sort of large-scale structure quite right, so you get the Gs and the I and L and various things. Um, you get the color certainly right, so it's quite encouraging. Without any fine-tuning, that's what we get out of this. And so it's not even quite converge actually for this particular result. But uh, but yeah, so that's something we're currently working on, try to really design peptides for these co-crystallized structures. Okay, so what I've told you so far, well, today, basically, uh, it's been on uh, these Lego pieces of proteins, right? Protein structures, protein structure to function map but at this single amino acid level. And so the goal here really moving forward is to take these Lego pieces and build larger structures. And so we are doing that by, by putting these uh, equivariant representations that we have on, on, on graphs. And so letting these amino acids start talking to each other in this reduced representation space looking at how T cell receptor actually bind to different pathogens, B cell receptors bind to different pathogens, or general protein-protein interactions. So this has been a lot of fun for us, and so we are, we are really excited as what, what can come, uh, come next. With this, I'll thank all the group members that have been involved, especially Michael Poon here, who single-handedly drove this project, because when we started, we didn't know anything about proteins or machine learning. So that was our way of getting in both fields. And I think it was a bit of a detour, but we, we learned some things on the way. Um, and now basically a lot of people in the group got in, interested in, in this line of project. And so all the people who are bold based are somewhat involved in various aspects of this project and also our collaborators, Phil Bradley and Jakub Otvinovsky. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Amitam, for this very good uh, talk. And uh, so, yeah, any any audience, uh, any audience question, please come. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, sorry, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I got a question concerning the densities that you mentioned. You said you uh, expand them in terms of spherical harmonics and Zernike polynomials. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, if I may comment, I think Zernike got his Nobel Prize for phase contrast microscopy in the 50s. Okay, great. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, I saw that you <clears throat> that you had this modeling in terms of uh, the Zernike polynomials and the spherical harmonics for different distributions. So you had the, the carbon atoms and then some other atoms, uh, I don't know, oxygen or whatever. And then I didn't understand what you did with them in order to get the full thing. I mean, so how do you put these different uh, distributions together? In order to get the function or the yeah the function in the end. You can think, Thank you. We can think about the input to a neural network as a very large tensor, right? And so each of these triangles, you just open them up. So you you make sure you know f zero zero of green color. The first row is always at position one, and the red color is always at position ten. So you make sure you you do this consistently always. But then yeah, so you just take all the numbers and make a giant tensor out of it. And that'll be just input to your neural network. And so then it'll be processed in an equivariant way. So that means you're not, so the, so I didn't go into detail of that. So what coefficients you can combine with each other, you're constrained by that, right? You wanna, you only want to combine coefficients that have the same L and M to make sure things are equivariant because 
they, they, otherwise they'd be transformed with different Wigner D matrices, right? So with that with that constraint, the matrix operation that you have will be, you know, you have a lot of zeros, but you know where the zeros are. So you fix that and then everything else you learn. So that's that's how it works. Yeah. 